why am I here to talk to you today? Um, I'm here today because I'm going to try and convince you that what we are doing today for medicine in space is necessary but not sufficient for what we want to do in the future in space. And the reason for that is because this has been our home for the last 20 years or longer, and longer I should say, in space. And this, on the International Space Station, we have become exceptionally good at taking care of people in space. So we have learned a ton about medicine, about health and performance in space flight, and we have been taking such good care of our astronauts that to date, no one has ever had to be evacuated from the ISS for a medical emergency. Knock on wood. That is wonderful, but our goal is Mars. And Mars is a different beast altogether. So if you think about it in very simplistic terms, the moon is a thousand times further from Earth than the ISS is. And Mars is a thousand times further than the moon is. So the challenge of going to Mars, the challenge of human health and performance on a mission to Mars is orders of magnitude bigger than anything we've ever done in spaceflight before. And NASA knows this. Um, and one of the reasons that the Artemis missions are planned, the way that they're planned, is because we are trying to train for Mars. We need new capabilities, new technologies, new procedures. We need an entirely new way of doing business in space in order to enable a Mars mission. And so every Artemis mission is increasingly complex with new capabilities, new technologies, and new procedures so that we can train and get ready for that first Mars mission. And the reason that Mars is so much more difficult than Earth from a medical perspective is purely the distance in a lot of ways. So the distance from Earth is our biggest challenge or hazard that we have to deal with from a medical perspective. When you think about our current state on station, we are very close to station. So if you may not realize it, but when station passes overhead on Houston, it is closer than Dallas is. And so because of that, we have a lot of conveniences on station that we will never have for Mars, or never is a long time, but we are not gonna have for, uh, for Mars in a very long time. And so the ability to resupply space station, we resupply all the time on a regular basis. You forgot something, you ran out of something, something broke, we'll just send you a new one. We also have real time communications almost every minute of every day with the space station. That is absolutely not gonna be the case for a Mars mission. We have regular sample returns to Earth, so we bring back human samples and medical samples all the time from station for research and for medical purposes. And we can evacuate if we need to. So because it's so close, if a major medical event were to happen on station, we could evacuate and have people on the ground and in a hospital within about 24 hours or less. And because of that, station was designed to be Earth reliant. Everything we do on station, all of our procedures, all of our protocols, everything is about Earth decision making and Earth dependence. Whereas a Mars mission is the exact opposite. So the distance is enormous, and as a result, the time is long in space. So a Mars mission will be longer than anyone has ever spent in space before. There is no ability to resupply that mission. There is no ability to have real-time communications on that mission. And there's no ability to sample return from that mission. And so because of all of that, our challenge from a medical perspective increases. And then perhaps most importantly, if someone does have a major medical event on the way to Mars, they are completely on their own. No one is coming to save them, and they cannot come home again. It is impossible. So as a result of that, we need to completely change the way we think about medicine, and we need to start thinking about how we become crew and vehicle reliant. How do they take care of themselves and their vehicle versus being Earth-dependent? So we need to build 
Earth independence in order to execute a Mars mission. In order to do that, some of the work that we're doing at NASA right now is focused on a few different areas that I'm going to touch on right now and talk about. And the first one is enhanced mission planning and medical system design. Somehow, we have to predict every medical event that's going to happen to the astronauts over the course of a two to three year mission. And we need to have everything on board that they might need to take care of themselves for every one of those possibilities. That is an enormous task. And the challenge when you're thinking about a task like that is this is essentially a form of the backpack problem, or for our international folks, the knapsack problem. This is an optimization challenge. We cannot take a hospital to space. And because of that, we have to figure out how do we decide what the right stuff is to take to space from a medical perspective that fits within the constraints of our vehicle? Because we are going to have constraints, mass, volume, power, data, all these kinds of things are going to be constraints on what we can do from a medical perspective. So how do we find all the right stuff to put on board? How do we give the people on board all the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need to take care of themselves on a Mars mission? Trying to figure this out is an enormous computational challenge. Um, so we've actually designed a tool called Impact that uses probabilistic risk assessment and some complex optimization algorithms. A lot of data goes into this system, and it needs a lot of computing power in order to predict all of the bad things that are going to happen from a medical perspective on a Mars mission. And then we simulate hundreds of thousands of missions over and over and over again while we optimize and design our systems and plan for what's coming in the future. The other thing we have to do is we have to be able to do in situ analysis. If we cannot bring samples home, then we have to be able to analyze them where we are. And that's a capability that we've very much not had on space station because of our Earth's reliance. And so what you see here are examples of some of the technology demonstrations that we've been doing on the space station looking at these capabilities. We've taken medical devices that are commercially available and we modify them for space flight to see if they'll work in the microgravity and space environment. We also work with companies that are producing new medical technologies and we tell them about our use case for space flight and they design their tools and their technologies from the beginning with space in mind. And we fly them to station and we test them to make sure that they work properly. And it's critical that we test them before the Mars missions because we need to know it's going to work. We have to have confidence in all of our capabilities that are going to be on board. We don't want something up there that isn't going to perform the way we need it to when we're on the way to Mars. Now, I very much hope that the first Mars mission has a doctor on board, but that is not guaranteed and is not a requirement. And so as a result, we have to anticipate the possibility that the people on board will not have advanced medical training. And so then the question becomes, can we teach them how to do medical procedures quickly if needed? And so one technology that we've been working on is pretty simple, but it's something that we've never had in space before, and that is procedure support software. So from a medical perspective, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make autonomous medical officers. And so this project, Amos, is all about creating software that guides astronauts through how to do complex medical tasks. And so what you see here is a non-physician astronaut doing an ultrasound on another astronaut. And in doing so, she's using this software to guide her through how to do a kidney and bladder ultrasound. And very quickly, within, turning, within the time of turning on the software and starting to do these ultrasound images, she was getting great pictures. So she was sending them back to Earth, and we were looking at them real time, and they were diagnostic quality images. So astronauts are relatively capable and intelligent people, and so we figure if we give them the tools they need to do these complex tasks, they're going to be able to do it. We just have to give them the autonomy in order to perform those tasks. Another thing area that we're focused on is how do we really efficiently use our resources? Every gram on board that spacecraft is going to be precious. And so we can't waste anything. And right now on Space Station, 
we fly bags of intravenous fluid up to the space. And if we don't use them, we just throw them out and we bring up more. That paradigm does not work for a Mars mission. So instead, can we develop new technologies that take drinking water on board a spacecraft and turn it into intravenous fluids on demand when you need it? And you can make as much as you need or you can make as little as you need. And we don't have to fly bags and bags of intravenous fluids on a Mars mission. So this type of technology has been developed on the ground, has been tested in space, and is now being miniaturized and hopefully will be included in future environmental control and life support systems so that we will be able to deliver intravenous fluids at the flip of a switch. And then last but not least, in order for people on the mission to make good decisions, they need access to information and data. And right now, they do not have it. All health and medical data, all human performance data is sent down to Earth, kept on Earth, and the people on Earth use it to make decisions and then tell the folks in space what to do. And that paradigm is not going to work in the future. So what we need to have is the ability to gather all of that human health and performance data. We need to be able to have it available to the astronauts on board, and then we need to use it to power clinical decision support tools. So this is where some new AI capabilities are hopefully gonna become terribly useful. AI requires data and information in order to help people make better decisions. And right now, none of that data and information is in space. It's all on Earth. So in the future, clinical decision support tools, integrated data architectures are going to be the key to giving the astronauts the knowledge that they need to make decisions when they can't talk to the ground anymore. And the reason that that is important is because we've already talked about the lack of real-time comms. But there's even a possibility, depending upon the mission, that the spacecraft is far enough away that the sun is between Earth and the spacecraft. And if that happens, we may have days or weeks where we can't talk to the folks in space. And that has never happened before. So they are very much going to be on their own. Now, the, the future of medical care in space maybe someday will be a a fancy Star Trek emergency medical hologram who says this phrase to you whenever you have a medical problem. I would love to see that future, but that is very far away right now. But somehow we're going to have to get from where we are today, which is terribly Earth dependent, to a point that is more and more independent over time. And so Earth independent medical operations is all about changing this paradigm and advancing the state of what we do from a medical perspective. And if we don't start now, we're never going to be ready for Mars. And so with that, thank you very much.